Acts chapter 4, if you'd go there with me, Acts chapter 4. I'm grateful to have the privilege to preach the Word of God, and I'm so glad we have the Word in our language, that we might give it, share it, preach it, understand it. I ask you this morning, are, are you a bold Christian, or are you a cowardly Christian? If you're put on trial as a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you in your life? There's a little boy who had a mongrel type dog and a man asked him, what type of dog is that? And he said, it's a police dog. The man said, it don't look like a police dog. He said, he's in the secret service. <laughs> and I'm afraid today, unfortunately, we have a lot of Christians today that are cowardly as a Christian. They're saved, but somehow they think they're in the secret service. There's the curse of cowardly Christians. They don't want to be caught with a Bible on their desk at work. Uh, they don't want to be caught with their head bowed in the cafeteria. They're afraid that someone might dislike them because of it, or miss a promotion because of it, or in some way mistreat them or criticize them because they're a Christian. Now they're saved, but they're cowardly Christians. The word boldness is used ten times in the Bible, not that many times. But you find it three times in Acts chapter 4. We find it's something that is attributed and connected to the Lord. We'll see that here. Acts chapter 4, I just want to read the three verses. We'll walk through the story in Acts 3 and 4 as we go through the message. But verse 13, the Bible says of Acts 4, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Now this is not a second Pentecost, that was in Acts chapter 2, but this is a filling of the Holy Spirit that the Bible says we are to have every day. Be not drunk with wine, we're in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. In our day... In fact, the manager of the beer store right here by Walmart says he's a Christian. In our day, you have more Christians drinking alcohol than you have filled with the Spirit. But the Bible says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And when they were filled, they spake the word of God with boldness. And I want to bring a message entitled, Holy Boldness. Holy Boldness. What is needed in this hour. That's what's needed in this hour. Holy boldness. Now, boldness means courage. It means liberty, freedom from timidity. Freely, openly, plainly, with assurance. It means confidence. Confidence, trust. Confident trust. Let's pray together. Father, as we look into your word, may you teach us. May we glean what you'd have by your spirit for our daily living. From your word now, open our eyes, we pray, to behold wondrous things out of thy law. May we look to Jesus this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What is needed in this hour in churches today is for the church to be bold, to be honest with people. People have all kinds of wild beliefs in our day about God, about his word, but the Bible, the truth is what it says. Our lesson in Sunday school this morning is the witness of God is greater. It doesn't matter what men are saying. It doesn't matter if every news media is saying. God says that salvation is in His Son, Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter what everyone else says. The witness of God is greater. It doesn't matter if I believe or you believe it. God is right. God is true. This is the record. This is the witness. He says over and over again in 1 John chapter 5. And so we need to be bold and honest. You and me, the church, we're the church. I'm not talking about being ugly. 
I'm not talking about being belligerent. I'm not talking about arrogance or presumption or brashness. Some people want to think they're bold, but really they're just rude and have bad breath to go with it, you know. That's not being bold. But bold is to speak the truth in the face, even in the face of opposition. Boldness is to have the courage to stand for Christ, even in the face of opposition. Look, it's easy to stand for Christ in here. It's easy to sing the truths of God's Word and to say amen to the preaching of God's Word in here. But when we're out of here, will we stand for Christ? Will we have the courage to speak the, Christ, the Lord? If someone tells me at the place, oh good, we do have one more of that part. I'm looking for my car. Praise the Lord. That's what I say. Right out. And you should do that too. Why not? Who, who is worthy of all praise? He is. Every good thing comes down, the Bible says, from Him. So praise God that that worked out. Good night. We thought we weren't going to get a turkey and there was one left. Praise the Lord we found that. And we ought to give praise to Him and be bold in our witness and talking to people. May God help us with that. A strong stand with the wrong spirit makes our faith seem sour. A sweet spirit with a weak stand makes our faith seem soft. But the right stand with the right spirit, demonstrates that our faith is both strong and sweet. In the case of Paul and Silas, the Philippian jailer there, uh, the consequence of the right stand is, was a beating and imprisonment. But what happened? They had a right spirit. And they saw a marvelous conversion. The jailer came out and was about to kill himself. Go ahead and do it! You just beat us to death and put us in this jail. But that's not what their attitude was. They had a sweet spirit. Don't, don't hurt yourself. Our, our Jesus, he's merciful. He'll save you and your house today. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Boy, it was powerful. The right stand. Here, the one that gave him the wounds, take him to his own house and washes their backs, their wounds, and their whole house gets saved. See, the right stand with the right spirit. Think what God can do with that. This conversion is the result of both the strong stand and the sweet spirit of the Apostle Paul. I believe that Jesus Christ was a gentleman. The Bible says he was full of gentleness, goodness. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, meek, long-suffering, all the way through, gentleness, good. All of that is Jesus. <laughs> and that will be shown in us as we're filled with the Spirit. And so I don't believe at all that he was anything but kind and hospitable. He spoke the truth. But he spoke it in love. Absolutely. That's our Lord. But he was also bold. That's why they said, no one else speaks like you. In the synagogue, they would stand and read the word, but they would not speak with confidence and boldness because they weren't sure if they really believed it, many of them. Or they were trying to make it fit their lifestyle in their century they lived in. That's still going on today. But see, Jesus, when he spoke, no man spake like this man because he was sure. He was confident that the word of God was true, that God was real, and God was on the throne and working. There was a sure confidence about him. There was a boldness about him. You say, well, how do you know he was bold? Well, did you read verse 13 with me there? Acts chapter 4, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they said, I remember someone else like this. <laughs> They're just like the one they were following. Jesus Christ. Absolutely. We'll live that trait. He will live that trait out in our life if we'll allow him. Now look how bold Peter and John are. Here they are facing these men. They've been arrested already and kept overnight. Look at verse 11. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ is the only way to be saved. Now I'll tell you that, if you say that in this world, this world will come down on you like a hammer. That's fine for you to believe, but don't you say he's the only way to be saved. They're going to call you bigoted, they'll call you arrogant, call you narrow, whatever else they may call you. But they also ought to call you a Bible-believing Christian. 
Because that's what the Bible says. There is no salvation in any other, only in the name of Jesus. Now that was boldness. It's bold to turn to the people that crucified the Savior not that many days ago and say to them, I want you to know something. He was the Savior of the world. You killed him, but he was the Messiah, the promised one. <laughs> That's boldness right there. No doubt about it. He was the Christ. He is the only Savior. They already have arrested them and held them overnight. What's the basis of our boldness? How do they have boldness like that? Peter couldn't stand up to a little maid two months ago. I don't even know him, and he cursed and swore to prove it. And now, in the face of the people that have already crucified their Lord, have already imprisoned them and arrested them and kept them overnight, he says, I want, to know, I want you to know something. He's the only way of salvation. And he's my Savior. <laughs> You're going to go on and on. We'll read a little more in a minute. What's the basis of that? It's linked to the Trinity. An in introduction, first of all, keep company with God the Son. Keep company with God the Son, Matthew 28, 20. Don't you love it? Go ye therefore, verse 19 says, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. What shall I command you? And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. I'm with you always. See, knowing he is with me, that's where the boldness comes from. God's with me. Speaking to the Xerox man this week, uh, about the, talking to us about a printer, just lives near here. And you're, you're talking about business. He's in there. He's uh, just a couple years probably older than me. And I begin to ask you if he knows the Lord is his Savior. Boy, you're, you want to get timid about sometimes things like that. But I know the Lord is with me. I remember as a teenager, we'd go out just like we do now with the teens on Wednesday. We'd after school, we'd go out teen soul winning. And I was the pastor's son. <laughs> So I'm supposed to do the talking. I'm supposed to know what to say. And, and I didn't, we didn't have a fisherman's club type program there. And so, uh, boy, I tell you, just about time we get nervous, I'd remember that verse, lo, I'm with you always. I'd help you. The Lord is with me. If Jesus is with you going to a door, would you be afraid? The disciples weren't. They just were with him and Jesus would do the talking. Well, through us, the Holy Spirit of God says, I'll help you. I'm with you. I'll tell you in that day what to say. I'll help you. You just go with the Scriptures by the Spirit of God, and He'll use you. Boy, it's such confidence, such boldness. So keep company with the Son. If you want to have boldness, keep company with Him. They say you can't take Jesus into the public schools. Oh, yes, we can. Lo, I am with you always, even on the end of the earth. See, Brother Ben Brinkman, he's not here today. I hate that. But uh, he would say that's why you shouldn't fly on an airplane because God said, lo, I'm with you. <laughs> that's not what he's talking about. But uh, you hear about the guy going through security at the airport. He came from out of, out of the country. You know, they wouldn't let you bring certain things back in, um, whether uh, different types of fruit and vegetables, uh, any type of animal type thing. They won't let you bring it back in the United States. Well, he had bought this gourmet cheese. Well, that's an animal product. They wouldn't let him. The guy said, I'm sorry, you can't bring that in. He said, this is expensive. I'm bringing it back in. He said, no, sir, you cannot bring it back in. He said, oh, yes, I am. And he leaves the line, goes back to back the line and eats it. <laughs> and then he went through. He brought it in. It was a little different package, but he brought it in. Well, I'll tell you, if the Lord is in you, they can say you can't bring him into the public school, and they say you can't bring him in a courtroom or in some public office, but you can. He said, I am with you always. There's no way they can keep Jesus out of your workplace or anyone else. Keep company with God the Son. Secondly, by way of introduction, have confidence in God the Father. Look what they said in verse 23 to 29, and being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, with Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, 
Behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Have confidence in God the Father. Did you notice what they said there in verse 24? Lord, they lift up their voice to God and said, Lord, thou art God. Thou art God. He is the creator of all things, that's what they said, which hath made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Thou art God. Why should we tremble when God is our Father? Well, the Sanhedrin had power. Here they're standing before the court now of the Sanhedrin, and now they've, they let them go finally. They had power, but God, their Father, had almighty power. They said, Lord, you're God. You made all this. We bring it before you. We're not going to tremble at that. You see, there's one fear. A holy fear of God will remove all other fears. Right. See, they knew. They were confident in God. Have confidence in God the Father. Jesus would implore, have faith in God. Have faith in God. Verse 25 to 28 there, he's quoting from Psalm chapter 2. If you went there, won't turn there for time, but he says, Who by the mouth of thy servant David, that's Psalm chapter 2, why did the heathen rage? People imagine vain thing. Verse 26 as well. And you read verse 27, 28, For of a truth against the holy child, Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, the people of Israel, gathered together, notice verse 28, For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Not only is he the creator of all things, he is the controller of all things. I mean, think about it. Whatever you determine, there's not a blade of grass that moves on this earth that God does not allow. He is the controller of everything. At dark Gethsemane, when Jesus was praying, on the cross of Calvary, all of it was what was determined by his counsel to be done. He's the controller of all things. See, God has never lost control. Not one blade of grass moves without his permission. God never said, whoops. Never. Never. Never loses control. He's the creator of all things. He's the controller of all things. That should give you courage, give you boldness. Look, if God wants me to die, he can take care of that. I mean, he just made my heart beat again. He just gave me another breath. The moment my time's up, it's up. There's nothing I'm going to do about it, or you. It should give us boldness to know God is in control. And I'm not saying to jump out in front of a semi or train, don't tempt God, Jesus would say. He didn't jump off the pinnacle of the temple, did he? But I'm talking about we can be bold in our witness. We're going to be fearful. God is in control of all things. And that's where these men were. That's why they could be bold in the face of death. They were literally facing death. None of us are facing that. Not for speaking the name of Jesus, not at this time in this country. But they were. They had already watched Jesus die, yet they had boldness. Because he's in control. Not only that, verse 25, notice it said, Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage? The people imagine vain thing. If you read in Psalm 2, later on in that Psalm, verse 6, the Bible says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. He is the conqueror of all things. Let me give you good news. We win. We're going to win. Jesus Christ is going to be enthroned in Jerusalem. He is going to win. Sin can't win. And faith can't fail. God is going to win. Now look, I've told you, things aren't right in this world. We know that. Things aren't right. They're not right, but they're going to be set right. Look, the bride should be with the groom. We will be when he comes. Right now, things aren't right, but in the rapture, we'll be with him. The church is the bride, see? See, Jesus is the king, and the king belongs on the throne. He will be when he comes again. See, Satan is a criminal, and he belongs in the dungeon, in the bottomless pit, and he will be when Jesus comes again. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. What's the basis of boldness? Keep company with God the Son. <laughs> Have confidence in God the Father. Receive courage from God the Spirit. See, boldness is in the triune God. Look at verse 29. They said, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. <laughs> I love it. I love what it says there in verse 29. It says, Grant unto thy servants. 
I try to every day remind myself who I am and get on my face before God and get as low as I possibly can. I usually get down just like this and pray like this at that point. I don't pray the whole time like that, but I do at that point and talk about, Lord, I die to myself and I want your Holy Spirit to have your way in my life. I'm your servant. Don't you need to be reminded of that? Because I've got an agenda. I've got a to-do list. I've got a calendar and appointments to make. But Lord, I'm your servant. If you want to call me like Philip from the revival in Samaria and to go out in the desert to meet some Ethiopian eunuch, I'm your servant. So my schedule is not what's important. You make my schedule because I'm your servant. <laughs> See, And so may God help remind us that. He said, they're, they're praying here, Lord, grant unto thy servants. <laughs> Proverbs 28, 1, the wicked flee when no man pursueth. But the righteous are bold as a lion. See, we've got a lion too. Often we talk about the roaring lion, the devil, but Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's with us. We can have boldness like a lion. See, now what did they want boldness for? Verse 29, that with all boldness they may, what? Speak, speak thy word. Speak thy word. Verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And what did they do? They went home and had lunch. No, they spake the word of God with boldness. God, by His Spirit, gave them boldness just like what they prayed for. And they began to speak the word of God. They began to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ with great boldness. Boldness. Did you notice they didn't ask for safety? They didn't pray, Lord, save us from these people. Help us. Give us safety, Lord. We don't want to be hurt by them. They're threatening us. No, they asked for courage. Lord, yes, they're threatening, but give us boldness anyway. Yep, they're threatening to put us in jail and beat us if we do. If we continue this route, they like to crucify each of us like they did our Savior. But Lord, we're not asking for deliverance. We're asking for courage. Courage to stand. Lord, this flesh is weak, and I recognize that I need strength by your Spirit. Give me courage. See, the threat was very real. We know what the future loomed in front of them. They're going to behead James in a minute. They're going to stone Stephen in a minute. See, we know what's ahead of them, but they're not asking, Lord, protect us. They're asking, Lord, give us courage to stand with you. I want to stand with God, don't you? Courage to do what God had put in front of them. They're asking, God, give us courage to do what's already got us in trouble. Help us not to cower in the face of adversity. They'd already been imprisoned overnight and threatened severely. Lord, give us courage. Courage to express God's word. Courage to extend God's hand. I love it in verse 30. It says, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and the signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. They were all in trouble because they healed that guy at the gate beautiful going to the temple, Acts chapter 3. We'll look at that in just a minute. He said, Lord, I want to extend your hand. God will through his people, look at chapter 5, verse 12, and by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. <laughs> that God's hand was extended through his people. See, anything you're doing apart from Jesus is not worth anything. In this life, anything you are doing that is apart from Jesus is not worth anything. God says if it's not of faith, it's sin. We ought to be doing everything in faith, looking unto Jesus, walking with Him. Now, four things I want to give you this morning. Number one, the source of boldness. We're going to move quickly. The source of boldness. What was the source? Well, we've talked about it. The source is God. Acts chapter 3 and verse 4, if you back up there, I'm just going to tell you the story there. What happened is they're going into the, the temple. This guy's over 40 years old. We know that from chapter 3, verse 22. My place, right? He, he's over 40. No, chapter 4, uh, verse 22. He's above 40 years old. Very likely Jesus had passed this man. Maybe even when he was 12, he walked right by him. He's been lame from his mother's womb. Jesus healed a lot of people, and this guy, everyone knew him. He sat at the gate, beautiful, going to the temple. And how often Jesus had been in the temple, yet Jesus never healed him. Wasn't his time yet. But in due time, God lifted him up, healed him. 
Well, this day he's walking in and Peter fastened his eyes upon him, verse 3 or 4. Uh, John said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him up by the right hands, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. He said, what was wrong with him? Something with his feet and ankle bones. That's what the Bible says. And he leaping up stood. He didn't have to go to therapy for six weeks or six months. God healed completely. Leaping up stood and walked and entered into with them in the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. What's the source of boldness? The source of boldness is God. See, the authority is God. You read the message that he preaches, 10 through 19 here. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms, the beautiful gate of temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened unto him. And as the lame had which was healed, held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch, what is called Solomon, greatly wondering. And you can imagine they're... they're you know, you'd be hugging Peter and John too. You healed me, I'm healed. And he's praising God and they, everyone's looking, what's going on? And they all knew who it was and this guy's jumping around. We've seen him lay here all this time. When Peter saw it, he answered the people, you men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Why look ye so earnestly on us as through by our own power of holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers have glorified his son Jesus whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go, but ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the prince of life. Talk about an oxymoron. Whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. In his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know, yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I walk that through ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers, but those things which God before has showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before preached unto you. And so, man, he preaches a powerful message, what God has done and what God will do. <laughs> You can only imagine. They stood in the courtroom there. In just a minute, they're going there. And the message that he gives about what our God is and who our God is. Wow, the authority is gone. See, it's not what you feel that makes you bold. It's what you know. It's what you know, see. What we know to be true about God. You're bold about what you're completely convinced of. Unless you're not sure. Do you know that you know Christ as your Savior this morning? Do you know that He lives within you? See, you're bold about things you're confident. If I was trying to convince you this morning, look, everyone say it with me, 2 plus 2 is 5. All right, let's say it together. 2 plus 2 is 5. You'd be like, I, if everyone's doing it except one of you, you'd be like, I don't know what's wrong with you on it. It's some kind of joke. It's a sick joke. I know it's four, right? You'd be confident. You'd be putting illustrations together. See, one, two, and two there, that's four. Count them out, right? I mean, you'd be so confident because I know it's four. See, when you know something is true, you have confidence and boldness. And I've walked with him and talked with him, and it's not just true that he existed historically. He lives within me, and I know he's real. I've seen him answer prayer, and I talked to him this morning. There's a boldness about it. If someone walked in this door right now and interrupted our service, it's actually illegal to do that. You can be arrested for interrupting a public service. But if they opened the door and started hollering, Fire! Fire! There's a fire! All of us would jump up and get out as quick as we could, and they would be very bold about it. Why? Because they would be sure that death was coming for everyone that didn't heed the warning. They've got to get out. There's a fire. I saw the flames. I know there's a fire. Get out. See, when we're sure of something, that's why the devil wants to make you doubt. That's why the devil wants to keep you defeated and discouraged and wonder if you're really saved and keep you back enslaved in sin. Why? Why are you that are freed from sin? Why are you going back into that bondage of sin? If he can keep you there, you'll never be a bold witness for God. But if you have seen something, you know something, it helps you to speak up. 
for your Savior, see. They had experienced the Lord. Let me ask you, have you experienced the Lord? Do you know the Lord is your personal Savior this morning? If you died where you sit, where would you be? You will exit this world. You will. There's coming a day, I don't care how strong you are, how young you are, how physically fit you are, or how healthy you are, there's coming a day you are going to leave this world. And when you do, there's only two places to go. Heaven or hell. Do you know the Lord is your Savior? He died for you. He loves you. The only way to heaven is through this name, the name of Jesus. See, there's assurance in that. The assurance is God. The source of boldness is Him. They were convinced and assured. They were persuasive because they were so convinced. By the way, they had, had experienced the Lord working their life. Look at verse 19 and 20 of chapter 4. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken to you more than to God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things that we have seen and heard. See, the source of boldness is confidence in God through prayer. See, prayer is not an escape from responsibility. Oh, no. Prayer is our response to God's ability. Prayer is not an escape from our responsibility. It's a response to God's ability. I know what God can do. Let's ask Him. He said to come to Him. And let's move forward in faith and confidence in our God. The source of boldness. Secondly, the sound of boldness. The sound of boldness is witnessing words. Just listen. Chapter 3, verse 18, 19. But those things which God before showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come for the presence of the Lord. Look at chapter 4, verse 7. They didn't like it. They didn't like his message. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power? <laughs> or by what name have you done this? <laughs> Peter could not have been asked a better leading question. <laughs> they gave him his text. I don't know if he was going to preach on the name of Jesus, but if you read chapter 4, that is exactly what he preached on. <laughs> they, they set him up with a wonderful lob you know, like a big cookie right in there, and he knocked it out. Unbelievable. On a, on a, unwittingly, I'm sure, on a silver platter, they put his text. Thus God makes the wrath of man to praise him. <laughs> the anger of Jesus' foes, he used to introduce his name. Look at verse 8. You want to know a name? You see the courtroom. Give us a name. Who's the one that's causing all this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, you rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we, this day, they, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of the, you builders, which has become the head of the corner, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. See, they hated Jesus. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. They put him to death. And now, they knew this text, the stone that was set at naught. It's from Psalm 118. They knew this text, and they said, the head of the corner. <laughs> it was Jesus. Boy, they didn't like to hear that. But I want you to notice something. Go to chapter 4, verse 31. They prayed in verse 29 that with all boldness they might speak the word. In verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul, neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. They had great power and great grace when they prayed and sought God to help them to speak, and they began to speak. The sound of boldness is witnessing words. They began to speak of Jesus. It's not personality. Well, that's just not my person. It's not about personality. It's not about tone. It's about words. Do you know where the bathroom is? Do you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior? It's just words. 
just words. All of us speak. Black Friday, some of you ladies are going to be out, and you're going to be shopping till you drop, and you've got to use the bathroom. And no matter how shy you are, you're going to finally, if you can't see it, you're going to ask, where's the bathroom? I've got to go, right? You can speak. It's witnessing words. That's the sound of boldness by the Holy Spirit of God where you get the source of boldness from. You must, of course, be a witness before you can witness. You must have witnessed God's grace. I remember on a University of Tennessee campus, we had the ministry called the Christian Volunteers. We'd go up there on the strip, and we, in college there, we had that Christian Volunteers, and we'd witness. And what a privilege it was. I remember meeting Aaron Sears. Played two years for Tampa Bay when he was drafted the NFL. 319 pounds, six foot three offensive lineman. And uh, I met him, it was right at dusk dark. We went in the evening and uh, began to witness to him. And boy, big guy. I mean, he was, I mean, I'm six, almost six two. But man, he doubled my weight then, not now, but double my weight then. I began talking to him about the Lord. And do you know the Lord is your Savior? Boy, I needed him with me. The Lord Jesus helping me. He began to cry. And we gave him the literature and he begins to weep. He said, my grandma, I was just getting off the phone with her. She'd been trying to get me to get saved. And his grandma had been witnessing to him. And we had the privilege to talk to him and give him the gospel. We prayed to receive Christ. Amen. Right there. It's just words. It's just using God's word, speaking and in boldness, having courage by the Lord's help. And he'll help you. People will be saved. That's what happened. He got saved. That's what happened here. They spoke the word. <laughs> we, you can be in a store, take a small step of faith. You can be in a gas pump, take a small step of faith, begin to speak. God will help you. God will help you. God will show up. We were in Evansville, Indiana, making that CD we made as a family, the Bowen family, and, and uh, we met a guy that was in their church. He was 90 years old. He was at the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. He was there as a soldier. Nine years old, but man, God had saved him. He was so excited about the Lord. He took us into his house. He wanted us to have come over for ice cream after. <laughs> and uh, he took us over, and uh, it was just right there next to the church property. He had all these canned goods up on his counter, just stacks of canned goods. And so he began to ask and find out. He goes to the grocery store, because there it's cold and things, and so he can't be outside very good, but in the grocery store... He, he goes there and witnesses and gives out gospel tracts all the time. He's, not, he's retired, doesn't have um, a job, so he can go there throughout the day and meet people, but they won't let him do it unless he buys something. And so he said, I'll buy anything if I get to give the gospel to people. So he buys some canned goods and stuff, and he uses that to give away to people in need in the church. But I just said, encouraged me. If this 90-year-old guy can find a way to meet somebody, to get the gospel to somebody, then we can. What's my excuse, right? What's your excuse? Praise the Lord. Yesterday I had 24 go out and give the gospel and saw one get saved. And thank God for that. The source of boldness, the sound of boldness, the success of boldness. Acts chapter 4, verse 1 through 4, after Paul, uh, Peter preached that message we just read, uh, the Bible says, And as they spake of the people, the priests, the captains of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. The Pharisees disappear in Acts, it seems. A lot of them got saved, I think. But the Sadducees really hated the message they're preaching because they were against what? The resurrection. And they're preaching that Jesus arose and the Sadducees don't believe in a resurrection. And so they really are at odds with this belief. Being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold the next day for it was now even tied. Howbeit many of them which heard the word of Peter believed. And the number of the men was about 5,000. Plus there was women and children, no doubt, but the men, 5,000, get saved. Wow. Why is it that when the gospel is given, people are saved? Romans chapter 1, verse, verse 16, the Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That word power is dunamis, it, where we get our word dynamite from. The gospel was given and 5,000, boom, hearts exploded, if you will, got saved. That's just the man. Dynamite. Hard hearts, no problem for dynamite. It's the power of God unto salvation. That's power. Then the signature of boldness, lastly, chapter 4, verse 8, the Bible says, they ask him, what name, what power? 
Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. What's the signature of boldness? Look at verse 31. When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. The signature of boldness is the Holy Ghost filling. You'll always be timid. You'll always be bashful when it comes to giving the gospel because it's not easy. If it was easy, everybody would do it, right? Giving the gospel is not easy because it's heart work. Heart work. And I can't speak to anyone's heart, and neither can you. Only the Holy Spirit of God can. I can speak to your ears, but God has to speak to their heart. This is eternal work. How can I do it? Only by the Holy Spirit. And so when I'm filled with His Spirit, God's heart beats for the lost. So much so He gave His only begotten Son for you. He bled and died for you. And so, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I can speak with boldness. Peter wasn't doing it on his own either. Remember what I said? Peter cowered at a little maid, teenage girl, that asked him, you're one of them, aren't you? But now he speaks boldly. It wasn't about Peter. Aren't you glad for that? Because I'm no Peter. I'm no Paul, neither are you. But it was about the Holy Spirit. And we have that same Spirit within you. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. And you're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. How do you glorify God? Jesus said, herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. The signature of boldness. What's needed in this hour? Holy Spirit power. Christians filled with the Holy Spirit. Be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to man for God does a couple things. It takes us out of our comfort zone. It helps us to need Him. Oh, would you pray for me? I'm going to talk to my coworker tomorrow at lunch. And I'm going to, it's Brother Rooks. I'm going to try to witness to him. <laughs> no, not Brother Rooks. But if you were going to say, boy, I'm going to talk to, would you pray for me? I've got a meeting with that guy tomorrow, and I know he needs the gospel. He's going through something with his family. Would you pray for him? I'm going to witness to him. You, you sense the need for God. Hey, at uh, Thanksgiving, in, in a couple of days, I'm going to witness to so-and-so. Would you all pray for me? I, I, I know I can't do it, but the Lord can. He can save him. Would you pray for See, it develops a need for us. All of a sudden, we're asking people to pray for us. We need help in this meeting. I'm going to witness to somebody, or I'm going out door to door on Saturday, like yesterday. I need the Lord's help. I don't even know who I'm going to talk to, but He knows all about Him. What is needed in this hour? We need to need Him. Look, none of you are wondering what you're going to eat today. I mean, you may be arguing what restaurant you might be going to, but you're not wondering what you're going to eat. You got food in your pantry. Got food in the fridge. Our closets are full. You didn't have to put on some rags today. We have clothes. In America, it's hard for us to need God on a daily basis. We didn't wake up this morning like most of the world did, saying, what are we going to eat today? How am I going to find food? Not what are we going to eat because I don't know what to choose. What are we going to eat because I don't have any food and I need to take care of my family? That's how most of the world, the majority of the world woke up that way today. But we don't need God like that. We have it. If all else fails, we've got a credit card. We can get something. But when you begin to witness, suddenly a surge of need of God comes in mind. If I'm going to talk to them for God, this is eternal work. I need the Lord. I need His help. See, it's a soberness that comes over us, an understanding that I need God's help. I end with this. Bold to ask. It's a story that Becky... Calvert told about her daughter, Julia. Julia was four years old. She had heard, she had seen enough five-year-old birthday parties. She heard, when you turn five, you're a big kid. So she's so excited, she's about to turn five. Every day, Mommy, how many days? How many days to my birthday? And I, she said, I would tell her. And so leading up to the big day, she's all excited, telling everybody who brought a birthday. She's the type of kid had to kind of keep an eye on unless you were at church because she didn't know a stranger and she talked to anybody, which was a good thing. That type of kid's a good thing because they can use that to give the gospel. But the mom said, put me in situations sometimes I was uncomfortable in because she talked to anybody, you know. Well, the day finally came, she said, I went to her school and uh, she was in a Christian school and took cupcakes and, um, uh, and balloons and things and she had her birthday thing and she was in K4 there and had her five-year-old birthday. When she left that day from her kindergarten, K-4 class, she had uh, this 
they had, they had the leftover cupcakes, she had this big teddy bear. It was as big as her. And uh, she gets in the car and she starts talking to her mom, says, how did the day go and this and that? And she said, what about this big teddy bear? Where did that come from? Oh, Mr. Thal gave it to me. She said, well, we really need to thank him. She said, I didn't really think like I should have with the busyness of life. A few days later, I saw Mr. Thal and it registered to me. We're not related to him. He works on the church staff in the academy, but uh, <laughs> to get this big teddy bear for our daughter, how do you even know it was her birthday, you know? And so <laughs> she said, hey, Mr. Thal, thank you for that kind uh, teddy bear you gave her. She sleeps with it every night. Boy, that was so nice of you. How did you know it was her birthday? He said, oh, she told me. <laughs> Oh, really? She said, starting to be you know, mortified. Like, oh. She said, oh, yeah. And I asked her, what do you want for a birthday? And she said, I want a teddy bear this big. <laughs> he said, so? I got her one. I wanted to make her day. And she said, all I could say was, oh. <laughs> but she said, then I began to think about just the boldness of a little child. To think about our father and the unlimited resources that he has. And, and I'm a parent. I like to do things for my children, don't you? I enjoy if it's in my, uh, within my strength to do so, to do things that makes them happy and, 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 and it be a blessing to them and what's good for them. And she began to think as she relayed the story. <laughs> he would give me if I just asked. How many times I feel like my requests aren't significant enough. He says, casting all your cares upon him. For he careth for you. Or somehow, if I ask for something selfish for myself, being a parent, we should know better. God delights in doing for his children. How much more as a heavenly father Hebrews 4.16 says, Come to mind many times. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace and we may obtain mercy and help and find grace to help in time of need. During my moments with the Lord when I lack boldness, the image of Julia with her arms spread wide open asking for a teddy bear comes to mind. Learn to ask. Our Father wants, wants me to acknowledge my need Abandon my self-consciousness and just ask him for what I need. He is God. Amen. He can handle it. Amen. Acts 4.29, they simply asked for boldness. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. In Acts 4.31, the Bible says, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. Their prayer was answered. Just like that. I believe... And if all of us in this room today begin to speak witnessing words and exercising boldness, we would all see revival. Because it would force us to beg God for help, to commune with Him, to need Him. Lord, help me now. This person looks mean. You know, they look ugly. You know, this person looks hard to talk to. It looks like some of these people right now. Just kidding. But I'm serious. It would force us. Lord, help me now. I need you. Much more than we do. Because cupboard's full, closet's full. And Lord, help us. Holy boldness. Let's bow our head and pray.